So if you need a VPN, go Nord. Use nordvpn.com forward slash Kimber to get a huge discount off your Nord VPN plan plus four additional months for free. It's completely risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. The link is in the show notes. Protect your computer like a cricketer protects its nether region with NordVPN today. Name and job title, please. Tom Moffat, Chief Executive of the Federation of International Cricketers Association. I'm going to throw you under the bus a bit here, Tom. So uh, a few years ago, you uh, uh, pursued legal opportunities uh, against the ICC uh, over player image rights. Uh, what was the what was the sort of crux of the issue at that stage? Is the way that the players' union saw it? Yeah. So the the, the starting point really was um, we had a number of issues around the world that were brought to our attention by players, agents, players associations um, around basically the unauthorized use of player image rights or um, or player commercial rights for for commercial purposes and. Um, the, the crux of that was basically a number of companies coming into sport and, and into cricket in particular um, using player imagery on, um, on their platforms um, for, for commercial purposes and, um, and the, the players didn't necessarily think that they had ticked that off, so to speak. Mm. Um, so they came to us to, to help try and resolve that um, and that's, that's really the crux of, of where the issue started. And so, so if that's the case, the, the advertiser or the company is probably still going to the cricket board and getting the permission from the cricket board, but they're not, the cricket board aren't going back to the player specifically to ask. Is that the kind of thing that was happening? Yeah, so in, in an ideal world, we, you know, we always want to see a situation where, um, you know, obviously if you're a player or an athlete, you know um, the value of your, your image and, um, and increasingly so really around the world in sport. Um, and if there's a situation where... Um, where that's being used without a direct chain of consent back to you, um, that, that's obviously an issue. So we always want to make sure that the, the athletes and, and the, the players are involved in that process. Um, generally around the world, that's through their, um, their collective representatives, so their players association in their own country or, you know, or, or through us at international level um, to make sure that there's, um, you know, that there's a proper process around both consent um, and if there's any commercials in, a, in in behind that, that they they all match up as well. And so, why did that become an issue in 2020? Because I would assume that that had been going on for 40 something years, ever, ever since cricket was professional and there was advertising to do with cricket boards. So, why in 2020 is it just a players that are a little bit more canny at that point and realise what what things are worth, or is it something else? Yeah, I th- I th- oh, there's there's an element of that. I think players understanding their rights a bit more, probably, um, but also with with the way commercialization of sports evolved we're seeing a lot more digital um we're seeing a lot more platforms whether it's fantasy cricket or whatever it may be um that are are really built around player image and attributes um and they're far more prevalent than they were you know 10 or 15 years ago probably so i think that's definitely been a catalyst for it that it's it's in front of everyone a lot more now than it perhaps has been i think you know historically you think of billboards and, and things like that but um, in in the new world that we're in, it's it's a bit more in front of your face, whether you're sitting at your desk or in your bedroom at home. Um, you know, mm-hmm. there's direct access, and that's a great thing for the growth of sport, and and it's a really important part of the growth of, of sport um, from a fan base perspective and a commercial perspective. But um, the back end of that also needs to match up as well. And and so. How does sort of play image and cricket boards work? I know a little bit. I remember there was an issue with the West Indies team um, when they went on strike a few years ago, where they were basically saying that they were being that the top players were happy with the wage, but they weren't happy with the percentage of the players' image um, that they were getting compared to the players further down who weren't getting used as much. Mm-hmm. So, do I know it's a collective um, thing, but does it? Does a player on a higher level on of a of a contract get a, automatically a higher uh, percentage of their image rights, or is it something separate to that? Yeah, so there there are different models around the world, and it's it's not necessarily a one size fits all um, is the, the short answer. But what what generally happens where there's a collective um, or a players association, best practice is generally that the the players will sign image rights um, to their players association and the players association will then um, do a, a 
uh, they'll, they'll reach an agreement with the governing body or the club um, or, or leagues um, around how um, around how those images can be used and, and how they can and can't be commercialised and put some tram tracks down for that. Um, generally in collective models um, where there's a, a collective bargaining agreement or a, an agreement on behalf of the whole collective of players, um, it'll, it'll be pretty flat. So there's not normally a, um, a huge differentiation between who gets what in there and the, the principle of, of acting collectively as a group is that everyone's in it together and you're, um, you know, you're all benefiting from the fact that you are you are part of a collective and for the top players, they were once the players at the bottom of that mm. collective and, um, and as your career evolves and you, you get more profile, then you end up at the top of the pile and it, it's probably a virtuous cycle that, that keeps delivering back. So that's probably the model. But, um, yeah, as I said, it's not necessarily one size fits all with that and there are a few different models around the world and, and intricacies around the world as well. So talk me through what's happened just of recent times with this Winners Alliance deal that you have and how revolutionary that is for cricket. Yeah, so what, what we've done at global level is um, is to basically, I guess, extrapolate out on some of the, the best practice models at domestic level around the world. So what I just explained where um, where, where players will, will sign certain image rights into their domestic players association that's now been extrapolated out to global level. So we've um, we've set up a global entity to make sure that across all the FICA countries, um, all the international players across the FICA countries um, have, have put certain rights together, I guess, which um, really is, is the first um, program of its nature that's, that's been put together around the world properly from the ground up. Um, we've now got Winners Alliance alongside us to help to make sure that we can really do three things with um, with, with the rights that the players have, have entrusted us with. And that's firstly to protect those rights and make sure that we're in a position to um, to stop the unauthorised use of, um, of, of player rights moving forward. Um, and that was something that the players and, and agents and players associations around the world were really strong on. Um, and secondly, also to make sure that we're capitalising on some new opportunities um, that building that model can throw up for not only for players but for the whole game, really. Um, I think, Jared, a lot of the work that you've done previously has looked at the you know the way cricket hangs together generally and the structure of the game and things like that um, and the rights landscape that underpins the structure of the game is incredibly complex as well and it's, it's incredibly fragmented. One way of putting it? <laughs> it's, uh, it's incredibly fragmented as well. So, And we often have everyone operating in silos in our sport. Mm. Um, and so what we, we want to do is to solve some of those pain points in certain areas you know, um, moving forward um, to make sure that, you know, at least on behalf of the players, we're making a, a, a really strong effort to solve pain points for whether it's governing bodies, commercial partners, licensees, trying to build licensed products, whether it's um, video games, trading cards, whatever that may be, um, that the certainly the, the players have come together to make sure that we're in the best position to to add value not only to themselves but also to the game as a whole so so on the video game so i think the major one at the moment is uh cricket 24 uh by big ant studio so from my memory of that is that the england and australian teams come kind of preloaded and then fans have to update all the other uh, other other players if if, I, if they came back to you for cricket twenty six or to cricket twenty seven, whatever the next version is, uh, they could do a deal with you guys and then have access to what five hundred, seven hundred players around the world that they could automatically put in, and the players would also get a cut back of being involved in the game rather than what's happening at the moment. Is that am I kind of reading that right? Yeah, so there's there's more than five hundred players who are part of our program, and it's most of the best players in the world that are part of what we've built. Um, the reality is that to make products like that really good, you need a combination of players and, and their intellectual property, so to speak, so name, image, likeness. Um, yep. They're obviously really what the products are, are built around and, and what fans and, and players want to want to play. But also in an ideal world, you want um, the IP of, of other stakeholders in the game as well. So if, if a product's built around an ICC event or bilateral international cricket, mm-hmm. I mean, you, I think you've mentioned the Ashes game there. Um, you know that that makes the product really compelling, and it makes it a great product for for people who are playing it as well. So, you know, in an ideal world, these things involve 
a combination of everyone working together to make them as good as they can be. Um, and we'd like to see that more and more across the game, not just in um, in the area we're talking about, but generally as well. Yeah. Uh, and this, so the Winners Alliance that, that, that you've done the partnership with, that's a tennis company, right? That is that something to do with Novak um, Djokovic or have I made that up or is he a founding partner or something? Yeah, so look, it's it it evolved from um, the Professional Tennis Players Association was set up um, a couple of years ago and you're right, Novak Djokovic was at the front of that um, and that was really set up to try and organise professional tennis players around the world. Is, is that a union as well? Is it? Is that kind of yeah, the idea there? Yeah, effectively, that, that was the starting point of it. And that, that still exists and is now up and running in earnest, um, run by Ahmad Nasser out of the US. Um, and they're bringing together the, the elite tennis players around the world to, to collectivise that group and help to um, to support players in, in that sport and make sure that they're, they're trying to get the sport going in the, in the right direction as well. Um, and Winners Alliance is a, a, a for-profit engine that really um, it, it's set up to to do some of the commercial deals, um, and it's, it's working with the PTPA to, to help mm-hmm. to, to commercialize some of the tennis players' rights and um, and solve some of the pain points that we've just talked about as well. Um, and our uh, our rights are now uh, they've got an ability to work with us and and help us to, um, to to do some of those same things in cricket as well and. The other pretty exciting thing about it from our perspective is because they're working with a number of sports, so obviously tennis and, and cricket are, um, are working with Winners Alliance now, um, what that spits up is an opportunity to put some of the best players in the world from both those sports next to each other um, for some for some pretty cool opportunities that we think are going to um, are gonna stem from the fact that you've, you know, you've got two global sports and, and some of the best athletes in the world with an ability to be on the same platform as well. You, you don't mean uh, Novak bowling to Steve Smith um, at, at, at the Australian Open, right? You've got you, slightly bigger plans than that. Perfect, perfect, tangible example, but scale that, <laughs> scale that, um, go go bigger and broader, and, and that's what we're talking about. Um, you know, from from the, I understand that. So the, I understand how it kind of works from a board level. Clearly, cricket, and you are aware of this as much as anyone, cricket is going towards a more ownership um, level. Uh, and, you know, it's moving towards probably freelance and players who are maybe um, play with certain owners rather than just with their national board, certainly at the higher levels anyway. How, how does that um, sort of fit into this kind of plan? Because it's you're going to have almost two tiers of cricketers at a certain point. You are going to have international cricketers who or international slash domestic cricketers, and then you're going to have you know, own uh, franchise cricketers who play a little bit of international cricket. Are they all kind of looked after with this? Yeah, so all, all the players, and as I said up front, the, um, you know, the players who are affiliated to FICA and, and who are part of our program are, are most of the best players in the world. And as we know, they the best players in the world play across both international cricket and, and in the domestic leagues, and they, they probably underpin both of those landscapes. So... Um, what what we well that's we, that's now though I'm sort of saying like what is it in five years time if if there are twenty players who play for the Ambani family and they're not contracted does that kind of still work under this kind of deal or do you do you have to evolve with that world as well Yeah, well, that, look, they're still part of our program, um, and there's okay. you know the, 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 there's no doubt that that'll continue to be the case. Um, as I said, we you know we work with the players and we work for the players, and that's the um, the intellectual property or the, the name, image, likeness that um, that we've aggregated. We don't house the the IP of the governing bodies or the leagues or the teams. So, you know, there's always naturally going to need to be different conversations in anything that you're trying to bring together. But what what we know again to to bring it back to um, you know getting the best outcomes for everyone is that when everyone's actually working together, whether you're a club or a team or a league or a national governing body or a player, um, when everyone's you know, ideally operating from a um, or seeing from a similar hymn sheet, I think you, you probably get the best outcomes generally, but also you know, in, the, in the commercial space we're talking about as well. A lot of people complain that I'm not a former cricketer and so that I don't really know the game. Well, you know what they can't claim? That I don't know desks. I've been using desks for years. I'm a collector of desks, old and new, and I'm sitting on a new one right now. I'm the Don Bradman of sitting at desks. So when I tell you that the E7 Pro next generation height adjustable desk from FlexiSpot is legit, this is like Michael Jordan talking to you about sneakers. This desk holds 160 kilograms. 
It is as stable as anything I've ever seen, and it has under-desk cable management. But really, the main skill here is that this desk rises and falls at the push of a button, and it moves super quick. And it has so many settings that remember your favorite heights. It really does it all. And I could not recommend the E7 Pro from FlexiSpot anymore, even though I am currently sitting on one of FlexiSpot's BS12 Pro multifunctional adjustable upgraded fabric ergonomic chairs. My butt and computer have never been happier than when using one of FlexiSpot's products. So get over to their page right now for big savings. And this is a bit of a side question, but it just came to my mind. Most of the players that you would have on your list would have national or state contracts um, to them. Is there a, still a membership for people who are freelance? Like, is that can you still be a member of of, of the union even if you're not part of a state or a national um, setup? Yeah. So we um, and, a, and a few of the groups around the world have come in directly to our commercial program, and you know, w with what we do more generally, not not just in the commercial space, but as a, an organization, we always want to help and support as many players as we can. And we, we want to um, reduce barriers to that as well. So historically, our organization has been built on domestic players association in each country has federated into to us and, and they're all mm. our members. Um, but we've probably, we've moved to a model where, um, where players around the world are, are able to be affiliated to us directly. Um, and this is one of those ways through our commercial program as well. Yeah. So, so if you went freelance, you could you could still be a member, and then you'd still be uh, part of that. No, that makes sense. Yeah. And um, obviously, I'm I'm pretty sure I'm right in saying this that the Indian players are not part of this. This would be uh, is it India, Pakistan? I'm trying to remember the teams that are not covered by you. Yeah. As so we've now 13 of the top 17 in the world, 17 countries in the world are now affiliated to FICA. So you're right, India, Pakistan. Sri Lanka and Afghanistan are, are, are probably the four that, that aren't at this stage. So um, we, we would love to, to help those players and work with those players in time, but appreciate everyone's in a different situation in, uh, in their own countries and, and how the game operates in their own countries. So um, that's ultimately a decision for, for players in their own territories as to, to whether they want to get organised and, um, and, and be supportive as well. And, and so... If if I want to buy the rights, I I know going in that I'm buying to everything that is in India. So there will be like almost almost like two different um, like a separate way of of dealing with those sorts of things. Won't they going ahead where you will have to go? But the problem is we go back to the old thing there. Whereas you can get Virat, but you can't get hold of uh, Rohit's agent and everything else. Like it is such a complicated issue if you don't have like that proper representation. Yeah, look, there's no doubt that in a perfect world you. Um you represent everyone, and that um, you know that that's the cleanest model you could you could ever get. Um, we don't have a blank piece of paper in our sport on any issue, <laughs> um, so we're, we're as you well know. So, um, and, and if we did it, it all look a little bit different. But um, we think what we've built is is seriously compelling, and, and we've got most of the best players in the world together um, to do some really cool stuff that we're we're excited about. What other things? I, I was thinking about this while I was doing the research today. What other things does the union kind of need to uh, well, does, need to is the wrong term there? But we know that cricket's a little bit further behind than other sports. Obviously, you know you, we're joining tennis, right? So even tennis, which which is a very separate kind of sport, is a little bit ahead when it comes to image rights. What other things? You know, if you could ma wave a magic wand, other than bringing all the other teams into your union, but what are the other things that you would like to see cricket start to tackle next? That you know, uh, for, especially from a union perspective. Yeah, great question. So we um, we spend a lot of time looking at the structure of the game, um, and, and in particular scheduling as well. Um, and I think that there's no doubt that at least around our board table, our player advisory groups, uh, which involve a number of the senior players from around the world also. This is one of the biggest issues for the game. It has been for a long time, so it's not a new issue, um, but it's it's increasingly reaching a point where we've got some really tangible examples of of big issues. I think the, the South Africa situation where we've got a, um, you know, a, a second or third string South African team going to play in New Zealand in a test series um, is probably a, a really good tangible example of what we see around the world, which is the clash between international cricket and domestic leagues um, in the calendar. Um, and I think, you know, one of the fantastic things for cricket is we're really sport for choice. Um, we got we speak to 
we've been with our colleagues from other sports here in Melbourne um, over the last week and we speak to a number of them about how their sports hang together and we've got three or four great formats in cricket um, that attract different audiences and different eyeballs and different dollars into our sport and different players and different player types as well. Um, but the, the biggest issue is really the lack of ability for the sport to come together and hang that all together in a really coherent way um, and make sure that the left hand is talking to the right hand um, and that in particular that clash between international cricket and domestic leagues um, you know, is, is ideally set up in a way that the two can continue to coexist um, because we, we speak to the players. We met with them in India around the World Cup um, we love international cricket. The players love international cricket and they want to keep playing it. Um, but obviously there's significant opportunities in the domestic leagues landscapes um, that are available to them. And you know, we, we, the, the reality is that the, both the leagues and international cricket are effectively owned by the same group of, um, of governing bodies who, who schedule international cricket. So there's definitely a way, if there's a will, to bring it all together in a coherent in a coherent structure, and we would love to see that because we want to see both thrive into the future. Um, but that, that's no doubt one of the biggest issues that the game's got to grapple with and that we want to make sure that we're representing the players strongly in those discussions and that they're, they're at the heart of those discussions as well. Uh, I mean, I think we can fit some more T20 leagues in at the moment. We only have five running. So uh, you talk about international and domestic <laughs> clashes. What about seven, seven or eight more T20 leagues? Uh, uh, you know, maybe one in Fiji at the moment would, would be quite handy as well. But... Um, the tennis thing's quite interesting to me, and I just want to come back to that a little bit. T- women's and men's tennis is separate, and so women's tennis is run for women's tennis sake, and men's tennis is run for that. That's actually been one of the most successful sports in the world for women. I want. I. I, w- I was wondering in general, and I'm not asking you to, to take a position, but we could see a situation in the future where women's and men's cricket are uh, are split and are run um, separately. But also we could see a situation in, within cricket, and you, you just brought this up a little bit yourself, that there's multiple formats. We could have you know, T20 running itself and Test cricket running itself and ODI running itself. Are these, do you think, viable future options? And would, the, would this help? It just feels like there isn't enough people in charge of cricket as it is, and on top of that, there's too much things to be in charge of anyway. Yeah, look, it's, it's a great point, and it's... It is one of the unique things about our sport is the the multi format nature of it, and I'm not saying with the with the issues I've just highlighted, there's no easy answer to any of those things because of the way it hangs together, and and everyone's got a slightly different lens on the world as well. So I'm sitting in Australia at the moment, and obviously big focus on international cricket and Test cricket in this country. Um, but you go to some of the smaller countries and and some of the different parts of the world, and the focus is very different. Um, so there's no doubt that um, you, know, you, you could see a world in which, um, in which those things were governed differently or, or, or by different groups, but we'll always advocate for a situation where, um, where the game is coming together to, to, to operate in a coherent way because it's ultimately, whether it's a different format or not, it's still the same sport. Um, and from our perspective, it's still the same players cutting across um, yeah. all those different formats as well. And, and I think the data very much bears that out that, probably most of the, the value in our game generally is built on the back of you know, probably the top 100, 150 players um, who are cutting across all those different landscapes and, and building the value there. So, um, yeah, it's, a really, it's an interesting point, but, yeah, we, we would love to see the game continue to work um, hard at coming together properly and, uh, and having a coherent model. It sounds like a man who doesn't want to deal with six different boards that I just created. But um, just on the on on women's cricket as well, I know that the unions have been talking about you know uh, gender equality, and we've had some things of recent times with some very good headlines about how um, you know the women are now paid the same as men, whereas you and I both know it's match fees, which is not the majority of pay that international cricketers get. Um, it, it's it's a tricky situation. Women's cricket has probably. I would say if you were investing in the game at the moment, that is probably where the biggest, you know, return for your buck is and the, you know, the way that that has changed. But it has over the last, well, since it merged with the ICC and, and cricket boards around the world, it has really become a, a game that has been helped by the success of, of the men's game. Um, where do you sort of see gender equality and, and everything within women's cricket and, and sp- certainly from the, from the pay perspective? 
So we're, we're in Melbourne at the moment. I think I've, I mentioned to you at a, um, a conference that's been hosted by the World Players Association. Um, we're, we're affiliated to the World Players Association along with most of the other player unions around the world. So our colleagues in rugby, football, um, and the North American sports, for example, as well. So the conversation this week has very much been focused on gender equity and how certainly in, in our role as players associations representing players, how we can effectively continue to, to push the dial on um, and making sure more countries and more parts of the world um, line up and, and have models that are, are best practice models. But there's no doubt the opportunity in the women's game in our sport, in cricket, um, you know, is, has grown exponentially in the, last, um, in the last 10 or 15 years in particular. Um, and the, the sport as a whole, has made some massive shifts and some mass- massive moves. Um, and that's probably been led, you know, to, to harp on again about Australia where I'm sitting, a lot of it's been led um, and and I think the, the, the CA-ACA relationship um, has probably been at the heart of a lot of the progress um, in the women's game in this country. Um, but to, to go broader than that, I think the, you know, the establishment of the women's IPL and um, and all the opportunities that that's going to bring as well. Um, there's, there's no doubt that there's some other great stuff happening around the world and there's been big progress. But what we would like to see is, um, is for, for there to be more countries continuing to invest significant um, amounts um, of time and energy and, and ideally equal time and energy into the women's game as they do with the men's game. Um, because if you, um, whichever way you look at it, whether you look at it from a, an employee's perspective, obviously, we, re- we represent players who are, are workers. Um, you know, we want to treat, see them treated equally. But if you look at it from a, um, an opportunity for the sport perspective, if you're not investing in the women's game, um, you, you're missing eyeballs and you're missing half the population, frankly, potentially, in terms of who you're, mm. you're accessing as your sports fan base um, and who you're accessing with commercial dollars. And I think you you, know, you, you mentioned there that it's it's obviously one of the the more attractive propositions for sponsors and other partners coming into the game, um, and that's that's for good reason. So we want to we want to continue to see that grow and develop. Um, and one of the things that we tangibly do to to try and help that is we produce our um, our global employment reports every couple of years, which really take a bit of a deep dive into the employment terms and conditions that players face in in different countries around the world. Um, things like you just mentioned with match fees and prize money and all those sorts of things and we highlight the great things that are happening around the world and, and maybe some of the areas for uh, for improvement um, around the world and, and want to keep doing that to make sure that we can ideally bring a, a level of accountability but also just um, you know, contribute to that conversation as well and make sure that we're doing that from a, a, a place of really understanding what's going on around the world. Uh, you personally, there was a Sally Moffat who played for Australia. Any relation? No relation, unfortunately, but if okay, that's I'll, right. I'll claim uh, it though. <laughs> <laughs> um, you come at this, you're, you're a lawyer by trade, that's, is, am I right? My background, not anymore, yeah. but that, that's yeah. my background. Yeah. Once a lawyer, always a lawyer. But um, <laughs> uh, saying I'm boring you obviously, or... <laughs> <laughs> well, My wife's a lawyer, so I can't say that. <laughs> but um, you, were, you were a first-class cricketer, um, you know, until uh, John Holland dis- uh, destroyed your career uh, when you played against Victoria all those years back. But um, <laughs> do you still think like a cricketer, or is the the business? I, and I don't mean that in a good way or a bad way. But uh, you know, you're you're quite removed now. I think you played in around two thousand nine, two thousand and ten when you were with South Australia. Yeah. Um, you know, are, are you still thinking like a cricketer, or all these years later, is is it? Uh, more trying to understand how to be the best advocate for cricketers rather than thinking like a cricketer for, firstly? Yeah, great question. And I think the answer is I, I definitely try to be both um, because I think in the, the role I'm in, it's really important. We have to understand what the players think and what they care about and what they want from us and from their associations around the world. So as I said before, we meet with the players frequently and we we speak to them a lot. Um and we, you know, we also get a lot of data in from around the world to make sure that we're we're accurately representing them. But to to your other point, I think you know the more we're involved in you know, we're involved in the business side of the sport as well, really, as as their advocates. And um, you know, we want them to be able to focus on the game and the the cool stuff. And um, and we're dealing with maybe some of the slightly not so fun stuff <laughs> at times um, off the field and and behind the scenes and some of the politics there. So. 
I think naturally, you know, when you're dealing with that day to day, yeah, you know, you do become more immersed probably in the business side as well. Um, but that that's part and parcel of it, and and we'll always try and um, make sure we're getting the balance right of um, of of being able to do our job jobs as effectively as we can. But um, yeah, look, I I have I haven't played for a long time, um, so I stopped playing probably more than ten years ago now, and, and haven't um, haven't picked up too many bats since then, which is um, which is probably a product of the fact that I think when you, you work in the sport and you're living and breathing it day to day. Um, yeah, well, there's not a huge amount of time, but also, yeah, I've, I've, I've probably drifted away a little bit from the playing side also. Um, don't worry, I won't ask you about South Australian cricket from 1995 to 2015 and what went wrong. But, yeah, um, please, thank, please don't. <laughs> but uh, thank you very much for trying to fix our video games and also look after cricketers. And thanks for coming on the podcast. No worries. Thanks for having me, Jared. Thanks to the kind folks at FlexiSpot for looking after my office and my butt by sending me their E7 Pro desk that save your favorite desk heights at a touch of a button. You don't have to crank anything. This thing just finds the height that you like and you can work. And their BS12 Pro chair that supports my posterior while I'm recording, well, this ad and all my shows. If you need great desks, especially ones that change heights or the best quality chairs, head on over to FlexiSpot today. <laughs>